Okay, the final act of the evening. Are you ready to show them some love? Yeah. The most love, right? They've been waiting the longest time. So are we ready to put our hands together for Louise Creakin? Yes, we are. Um, on that note, thank you so much for coming out of Miss the Survival Fear. Um, me, I'm not scared of coronavirus. The thing I am scared of is I'm in a same-sex marriage. And think about this, two to four weeks quarantined with someone whose menstrual cycle has synced with yours <laughs> and a shortage of painkillers. <laughs> it's gonna be like the fucking Hunger Games. <laughs> Right, so that's current affairs. <laughs> I'm a Victorianist. I'm uh, sponsored by Emily Bronte. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking mainly about the 19th century. I'll hold on to your hands. <laughs> so the problem about being a Victorianist is there's a lot of stuff about the 19th century in the media, uh, on TV, on the radio, on Radio 4. My mother... <laughs> who's over there. It's not Nicola Sturgeon, she's Geordie. It's not Jeanette Cranky, again, she's a Geordie. But if you see her, that's my mother. And I said I wouldn't mention her. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, um, and my mother will maybe weekly ring me about something that she's heard on Radio 4 about the Victorians. So I'll get this phone call and I'll be like, see, Louise, the thing about the Victorians is that Queen Victoria didn't believe in lesbians. And also, they, the doctors just used to rank them off because they all had vibrators because of hysteria. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking woman's hour. <laughs> Women's Hour is if they wanted to, if Radio 4 wanted to, I'm sure they could incite a certain demographic of the population of middle class, middle aged women to revolution. So they could start it right up. The thing is, see how when fascism was on the rise and they went into the universities and took out the academics, first they'd come for the managers because they'd want to speak to them. Then they'd come for the Gordon's pink gin. <laughs> if you think about it, syntactically speaking, live, laugh, love is kind of like I'll bite my fry. Anyway, so, on that note, two things that are famous misconceptions about Victorians, and they're both to do with sex, so, you know, again, hold on to your hats, so whatever. Um, firstly, the Victorians were not prudes. They did not cover table legs because they were so offended. That was a rumour started in the 1830s by someone called Frederick Marriott. This is pretty much all the historical information I'm going to give you because, you know, half the dirt is bright club. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, is that it makes no fucking sense for Victorians to be prudes about sex because 80% of the British population in the Victorian period lived in the same room as their family, usually in the same bed. So it would make no sense for you to be sleeping with your, you know, your eight siblings and mummy and daddy are wriggling about, mummy and daddy, what's that wriggle about? <laughs> Just keep looking at that covered table like Janet. <laughs> That'll spare your innocence. So it makes no fucking sense, right? Other thing about Victorians is the complete opposite. It's because of bodice rippers and Mills and Boone, we think that, oh, corsets, sexy. No, they are not sexy. They are whale bones crushing your ribs, right? So we think of this like kind of test of the Durbervilles, like, oh, milk maiden with the, with the boobs and the bodice. And just, oh, is she milking the cows, pulling the udders? Oh, there's another udder. <laughs> not a thing, right? And also, I can kind of understand the whole slut shaming thing um, in the Victorian period, because quite frankly, you've got four layers to get through before you can get down to anything, so you've got time to back out. <laughs> um, so now that we've dispelled some, you know, misconceptions about Victorian attitudes to sex, I'm going to talk about dick. <laughs> oh, 
it goes down here from here, it's basically all innuendos. <laughs> um, so, first things first, Dickens was a massive prick. Yeah, he, he, he definitely lived up to his name. He had a pet raven. <laughs> what kind of wanker has a pet raven? Dickens. Also, Dickens, when he first started publishing, he called himself the inimitable, which is a word I can't say, um, boss. This is his thing. And he would just sign off with his adjective. And basically, the word that I can't pronounce means that you can't imitate him. And his first publication, what kind of cisgendered white man move is that, right? The thing is, is that if you take ownership of an adjective, then it's not necessarily true. I could play that game, the merciful pretty Patel. <laughs> The powerless Dominic Cummings. The competent Boris Johnson. <laughs> Doesn't make it fucking true. Another thing that Dickens did, the ultimate big Dickens energy move, some of you, <laughs> is when he decided that he was going to leave his wife for another woman, did he move out the house? No. Did he make her move out the, ma the house? No. He sent her away for a couple of days, and then he built a wall in their bedroom. <laughs> yeah. And as we all know, building a wall is the ultimate patriarchal power move. <laughs> Just ask Donald Trump. <laughs> so anyway, Dickens bit of a prick. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna sex up Dickens for you, because not enough people read Dickens. I mean, as a Victorian, I know that Dickens is fucking sexy. But the thing is, is that if you wanted to make a porno out of actual realistic Victorian life, maybe you'd have to go for something like Strip Search, based on the 1864 Contagious Diseases Act, <laughs> in which any woman suspected of being a prostitute could be arrested, intimately searched, and quarantined for several months. And you think the coronavirus is that. <laughs> so that's not overly sexy. So I thought I'd take some inspiration from model, from, ooh, from modern pornos. See, I love pornos. <laughs> On a linguistic level. I really fucking love... I really fucking love the parodies. Right, so I went to do some research on this. How about uh, parodies like Lawrence of the Labia? <laughs> Pirates of the Peritoneum? <laughs> Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> um, so I thought, oh, what if I did that for Dickens? <laughs> so we've got Nicholas Nickleby. <laughs> a tale of two titties. <laughs> Hopefully it's just the best of times. <laughs> Our mutual friend. It's like two girls, one tankard. <laughs> Martin Guzzle Tits. <laughs> no one reads that one. <laughs> Not even Victorianists. But the thing is, is that Pornhub became a thing and that ruined the art form of the parody porno name. Because the thing is, is that for Pornhub, you have to optimize your porn titles for search engines. So you have to Google exactly what you want. So you can't do any of the sort of artistry. So instead of something absolutely hilarious, like all over our tits, <laughs> um, twist, you'd have to go for something like Workhouse orphan, umpapa, secret middle class, with Jewish man and boys. <laughs> Which is problematic. <laughs> You've been a lovely audience, thank you so much.